At 5,525 miles long, the border between Canada and the United States of America is the longest undefended border in the world. Both nations have enjoyed decades of cooperation in defending the North American continent from external threats and have shared cultural and economic interests to exploit. However, it was not always this way, particularly during the early decades. Following the emergence of the United States as an independent nation during the American Revolution in 1776. Looking northwards, many Americans felt a sense of kinship with those living under the British crown on land that would one day become Canada, and who also desired to break away from the British in pursuit of their own destiny. While the future Canadians didn't seem to have the same collective desire to become independent as their former cousins south of the border, that didn't stop some of them from trying, and there were more than a few Americans willing to help them. This would result in a chapter of history that is seldom talked about today, but would have massive ramifications in the arena of international law surrounding warfare. This is the story of the Caroline Affair, and how it has been referenced, if not directly, then certainly indirectly, prior to almost every major conflict since 1842 as it outlined when one country could attack another first, yet still act in self-defense. Welcome to Wars of the World. After the 13 American colonies broke away from British control during the American Revolution and successfully won their independence, tensions between the British Empire and the infant United States remained high for many years. For the United States, there was forever the fear that Britain was just biding its time and waiting for an opportunity to strike south from British North America, modern-day Canada, and reclaim their territory as a colony. The British, meanwhile, were concerned of the effect American independence, through armed insurrection, might have on other colonies, particularly in the aforementioned British North America. In 1803, Great Britain once again found itself at war with Napoleon's France, and this conflict would wage across the globe between the two empires. The United States tried to stay out of the fighting, but relied upon both powers to help bolster its burgeoning economy. However, both London and Paris demanded that the US sever trade ties with their opposite number, lest they incur their wrath. The American Congress tried to impose restrictions on the import of goods from the warring powers, hoping this would help keep them neutral. But the European economic superpowers barely noticed, and the restrictions only damaged the American economy. At the same time, the American people were growing more and more frustrated with British actions taken against them. Britain refused to acknowledge American neutrality, and saw any good relationships with France as a declaration of support. British warships also seized a good number of American vessels and impressed them into service supporting the British war effort. Against this backdrop, on March 4, 1808, James Madison Jr. became the fourth president of the United States and warned his government that American involvement in the war was inevitable. On June 18, 1812, for the first time in his country's history, the US declared war on another country, namely Great Britain, sparking the conflict remembered as the War of 1812. American aims in the conflict were clear, to strike a swift blow against the British, forcing them to the negotiating table where clear trade routes for American shipping as well as American honor could be secured. The US therefore invaded British territory in Lower Canada, hoping to catch a land which could be used as a bargaining chip with London. However, the invasion turned into a disaster when British troops eventually invaded American territory, famously burning down the White House on the evening of August 24, 1814, in retaliation for American forces burning down York in Upper Canada. The war ended with the Treaty of Ghent, ratified by Madison on February 18, 1815. 
which called for a return to the pre-war status between the two countries after 15,000 Americans and 10,000 British Empire troops had been killed. In the years after the war, successive American governments sought to improve trading relations with Great Britain. American cotton from the South, for example, was increasingly sought after by the British textiles industry, which employed some half a million people in Britain, the imports eventually accounting for 80% of the material used in British factories. Yet despite this lucrative trading relationship, there was still mistrust on both sides, with many Americans feeling betrayed or let down by their government for the way the War of 1812 was concluded. At the same time, in both Lower and Upper Canada, tensions over social, economic, and political issues were beginning to rise. The situation was not helped by a growing number of American immigrants looking to seek their fortune by farming land in the region on the condition that they took an oath of allegiance to the British Crown. This led to disputes taking place over whether many of these settlers were legal citizens or simply Americans living on Canadian land. In order to address these issues, a reform movement arose that aimed to topple the ruling class and create a fairer society within Upper Canada's governing body, but the ruling families managed to block its rise to power through political means. Frustrated by this, the more extreme elements of the movement broke away and created their own movement that believed that only independence from Britain would lead to the system they sought to create. This extreme group then also splintered, resulting in a smaller, even more radical movement that called for an armed insurrection, similar to how the United States had won its freedom. Led by Scottish-born William Mackenzie, at first the radicals again attempted to make political gains, but suffered painful defeats in the 1836 elections, leading Mackenzie to push for his armed revolt, believing this would inevitably inspire a wave of Canadian support, forcing Britain to accept Upper Canada as a republic. Knowing he had support south of the border, he began making contacts with Americans, willing to supply him and his revolutionaries with weapons. On December 5th, 1837, he led his ragtag force towards Toronto, his plan being to march on the house of the Lieutenant Governor Sir Francis Bond Het and demand his surrender. However, as they approached Toronto, they were fired on by forces loyal to Het, causing them to disperse in confusion. Het's forces went in pursuit and two days later fell upon them at the Battle of Montgomery's Tavern. Completely outgunned, the rebels were routed, but Mackenzie and a few others managed to flee, and with the popular support he had dreamt of having failed to materialize, he had no choice but to make a dash for the American border. Reaching the Niagara River, Mackenzie and his surviving followers took up residence on a small, uninhabited island known as Navy Island. Still believing that the Republican sentiment was strong enough in both Upper and Lower Canada to achieve final victory, Mackenzie set up the government of what he had proclaimed as the Republic of Canada on the island and outlined his call for American-style democratic reform. From Mackenzie's immediate perspective, his plan must have seemed like it was beginning to bear fruit for having arrived with just 25 men. In the coming days, Navy Island's population grew in excess of 600, ready to rise up and create his new republic, with many of them coming by way of American boats sailing across the river in support of the rebels. One such vessel was the small, privately owned steamboat, the SS Caroline. The Caroline had only been purchased by its owner, American William Wells, six months before Mackenzie's uprising, it having been seized and then sold by the government after it was discovered it was being used as part of a smuggling operation. Wells appeared determined to maintain the vessel's smuggling credentials, continuing to deliver supplies for the Canadian rebels, although he later claimed he had no idea what the contents of the casks he was delivering contained. During their occupation of the island, Mackenzie's forces made it clear that they would not give up their armed insurrection and bombarded forces loyal to the British on the mainland, as well as disrupted river traffic in the area. Fearing that the support for the rebels would only grow over time, the loyalists had to act quickly. 
and they felt one of the best ways to damage Mackenzie's forces was to deny him supplies from the United States. Information regarding the Caroline's activities made it to the ear of Canadian loyalist Alexander MacLeod, Niagara's sheriff on the British side of the river. With American authorities either unable or unwilling to stop the flow of supplies to the rebels, it was decided that direct action was going to be necessary if the Caroline was to be stopped. This, of course, presented a number of problems for the British and the Loyalists. Firstly, the Caroline was an American-flagged vessel and crewed by Americans. There was already a large support base amongst the American population for the rebels, and the destruction of American property, or even the killing of Americans, might only fan the flames and result in another North American war breaking out between the two powers. If this were not a precarious enough situation, McLeod's information put the Caroline moored up on the American side of the river, in American territory, the US being officially neutral in the fight between the Loyalists and the Rebels, even if that position didn't exactly translate into reality. However, the counter-argument was that American citizens were supplying weapons used to kill Loyalists, and that American inaction to stop it could be construed as the American government siding with the rebels while keeping their own hands clean. Furthermore, the capturing of the Caroline might discourage further American support for the rebels. Thus, Loyalist Colonel Alan Napier McNabb issued orders for a force of some 50 Canadian militia to form at Chipewa under the command of Royal Navy Captain Andrew Drew, and on the night of December 29th, 1837, they set off across the river and into American territory. That night, the Caroline was moored up at Fort Schlosser in the state of New York when Drew and his force made their move to capture it. On board were 10 crew members and approximately 25 men who had failed to find lodgings nearby and were so bedding down on the ship for the night. The exact chain of events that took place during the raid to capture the Caroline are unclear and still contested, but what is known is that Drew and his men boarded the vessel, taking the crew by surprise and removing them and their guests from the steamboats. The raiding party then attempted to start the vessel's boiler with the intention of sailing it back across the river. However, they were unsuccessful, and so Drew gave the order to free the vessel of its moorings and set it on fire. The burning Caroline floated from the dock until it was caught by the currents and was last seen heading over the Great Niagara Falls into oblivion. However, the raid was not bloodless, and an African-American watchmaker who was aboard the Caroline that night, named Amos Dufree, was shot and killed, although why and by whom is still not clear. Some sources also claim that a cabin boy, known only as Little Billy, was also killed in the raid, but it was only Dufree's body that was recovered, and rather grotesquely displayed in a nearby tavern as an example of what the British had done to an American on American soil, further enraging the public in New York. A US citizen and a rebel fugitive were taken prisoner during the raid, but the American was eventually returned unharmed. The British and Canadian loyalists considered the operation a success, and McNabb was later knighted for taking the bold action. Meanwhile, in the days that followed, Canadian militia positioned field guns along the banks of the river and bombarded Navy Island until on January 11th, 1838, they were forced to either surrender or retreat to the United States. Two key players in the rebellion, Samuel Mount and Peter Matthews, were captured and pleaded guilty to treason, resulting in their hanging. But Mackenzie once again proved too slippery for the Loyalists and escaped to New York, where he would remain in exile for 11 years. Even before the Caroline was destroyed, Mackenzie and his Republic were garnering a great deal of support from American towns and cities along the northeastern border with the formation of a Patriot Army. Going under the name of Hunter's Lodge, the organization, comprising of exiled Canadian Republicans and volunteer Americans, eventually numbered 160,000 men under the command of Rensselaer van Rensselaer, while Thomas Jefferson Sutherland organized popular and political support, 
On January 5th, 1838, they raided the Detroit jail and secured for themselves over 450 muskets. And on January 9th, they attacked the British at Fort Malden in modern-day Ontario. Unfortunately for the Patriots, the attack failed, with the vessel they were traveling on being beached and a number of participants being captured. Nevertheless, during 1838, an undeclared and unofficial war raged along the Niagara River between Britain and the Canadian Loyalists and the American and Rebel forces. The Patriot Army attacked several settlements, committed a series of murders, and attacked British shipping on the Niagara River. For recently elected US President Martin Van Buren, he found he had arrived in office with his country on the verge of another major conflict, breaking out with America's biggest trading partner, the results of which would be catastrophic. 1837 had been a particularly difficult year for the American economy, with several New York banks running out of hard currency in their reserves. His predicament was not helped by the fact that the US had no significant standing federal army at this time, preferring instead to rely on local militia groups to be formed in times of crisis. What federal army there was at this time was tied up fighting the Seminole Indians, who, at the same time Mackenzie began his rebellion, had launched a major offensive against US forces in Florida. In short, a war with the British Empire was the last thing he needed, but he couldn't simply wave off the incident either, as state elections loomed in 1838, and the Democratic Party, which he helped found in 1828, was still the subject of mistrust amongst many voters. Van Buren therefore walked a tightrope of addressing British aggression and appeasing some of the more excitable members of the American population calling for war. To that end, he dispatched General Winfield Scott to the region to raise a militia, but was instructed to be careful in selecting candidates, Van Buren wanting him to weed out those eager to start shooting across the river. Officially, Scott's force was there to protect against any further British aggression, However, unofficially, he was also there to curb American support for the rebels and curtail any further American insurgency. In the latter case, Scott had his work cut out for him, as American journalists had greatly exaggerated the raid on the Caroline, leading to fanciful reports that included as many as 22 people having been killed by the British, but through sheer personality, Scott succeeded in bringing the Patriot War to an end. Meanwhile, Van Buren engaged in a diplomatic offensive, lodging protests with the British. The British responded by stating they were acting in self-defense to prevent further rebellion that would lead to bloodshed among those still loyal to the crown. But America disagreed, arguing that their neutrality in a neighboring conflict had been violated. Then, as with so many other news stories, the Caroline affair largely slipped away as the news started to focus on events occurring in the following months. That would probably have been the end of the story, were it not for the drunken confessions of Alexander MacLeod whilst in New York City in November 1840. MacLeod reportedly told patrons of a tavern that during the boarding of the Caroline, his sword had drunk the blood of two men on board the vessel. The New York authorities were alerted, and MacLeod was arrested on murder charges on November 12th, catapulting the Caroline affair back into the public consciousness. British ambassador to the United States, Henry Stephen Fox, protested the charges placed on MacLeod, since there was an established legal precedent that people could not be criminally charged for their actions if those actions were taken under orders from their government. However, this fell on deaf ears, and the trial continued. Fearing a further deterioration in relations with the British Empire over a matter that had almost been dismissed by this point, the federal government attempted to intervene, but were rebuffed by the New York states, the crime having taken place in New York, and therefore being a matter for the New York courts. During his trial, no corresponding evidence could be presented aside from his drunken boasts that MacLeod had actually participated in the event itself and with witnesses giving him an alibi that he was nowhere near the vessel on the night of the raid, it took the jury just 20 minutes to find him innocent.
However, McLeod's arrest was just the latest in a growing list of disputes in the wake of the rebellion that was affecting relations between the two powers in North America, neither of whom wanted war, having their own problems to contend with elsewhere. Thus, a special diplomatic mission was arranged by both sides to investigate the Caroline affair and draw a conclusion over it. US Secretary of State Daniel Webster and a new British envoy to the United States, Lord Ashburton, began talks in 1841 with the aim of settling the matter once and for all. While there were disagreements on certain facts surrounding the burning of the Caroline, their negotiations helped settle a number of border disputes between their respective nations that had contributed to the current situation, greatly reducing tensions along the border. But in addressing the legality of the British and Canadian loyalist actions, they inadvertently set a precedent for what constituted the preemptive use of force in self-defense against an imminent threat from another power. For his part, in arguing the US case, Webster said that such acts only fall under the umbrella of self-defense when the threat is, quote, instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment for deliberation. This meant that military action could only be taken first in self-defense legally if all other avenues had been exhausted or were impossible to pursue before an attack was set to take place. Furthermore, the negotiations also highlighted that the British raid had been within the constraints of self-defense, as opposed to an act of naked aggression, since their incursion was limited solely to the target that was aiding in a legitimate threat to themselves, in this case, the Caroline, which was supporting the rebels on Navy Island. Following the Webster-Ashburton Treaty in 1842, many nations have applied the Caroline Test, as it became known, to justify taking actions against hostile states that were believed to be supporting or planning to take military action against them. The basic principles of the test have been used to investigate the legality of nearly every major conflict since, and have, in recent decades, been extended to cover non-state actors, such as terrorist groups, in the wake of the 9-11 atrocities. And it all stemmed from a burning steamboat falling over the Niagara Falls on one cold December night in 1837. And there you have the story of the Caroline Affair. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.